Welcome to the Clifton Worley Show. This week we have Daniel Shields. Hey, Daniel. Hey, how you doing, Clifton? I'm doing great, man. Um, really excited to be talking to you today. Um, now, we met just like briefly for a few minutes at Summer yeah. Um And uh, there was some guys there who, who knew you that I got to spend some time with, and they were telling me about your, uh, about your company, DS Guitar Engineering. And uh -huh. um, so that's where I became familiar with it. And then um, literally probably my last 20 minutes I was at NAOM, I happened to run into you and we had a brief conversation and uh, got to meet each other. And so um, I wanted to uh, have you on the show and just kind of get your story on um, you know, how DS guitar engineering came into being but also um i like to talk about i like to talk about um you know our musical backgrounds and how we get started and everything so sure. um if you would just kind of introduce yourself a little bit and uh we'll go from there okay uh yeah i'm daniel shields obviously um i've I guess I'll start with the musical background. Is that okay? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, okay, cool. Um, I actually remember my first ex kind of experience with music pretty well uh, when it when I first became attracted to it. I was at a uh, amusement park right outside of Chattanooga, Tennessee, called Lake Winnipesaukee. Uh, I think I was about five years old at the time something like that and uh my family had been there all day and they had this little stage next to the lake and there was a band playing there i don't really recall what kind of music they were playing but i was just uh really taken back by it even as a little kid and just kind of stood there watching them and i watched the sound guy tweaking all the knobs and faders on his board and my parents took notice of that, and uh, I was I was raised in the church, and uh, we were there, you know, pretty much every Sunday. And my parents noticed the same sort of thing at the church. I would watch the pianist, and uh, so my mom eventually asked me if I would like to take piano lessons, and uh, and I did. So. Uh, I took lessons for about 10 years, I think. Um, I think I was a, a, a freshman in high school when I stopped taking lessons. Um, and that's actually my primary instrument. I don't think most people know that about me, but I've been playing piano for, I guess, 21 years now. Um, okay. So I definitely consider that my primary instrument. Um, as far as the guitar side of things, when I was a, I think I was a junior in high school, I asked for a guitar for Christmas. I got one of those uh, Sam's Club starter packs with the pack stamp and the, mm -hmm. uh, the Fender Starcaster. Uh, so I started playing guitar then, and uh, honestly, haven't improved much since then. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I fell in love with the guitar. It's a really interesting instrument, so expressive, and you can put so much emotion into it. And, I mean, I guess that's true of most instruments, but I think there's something kind of special about the guitar in that regard. Yeah, yeah. So did you? So you said you kind of grew up in the church. You were learning to play piano. Did you? Did you play piano in church? Yeah, I did. So. Um, as I was learning, I would start to to play for the church congregation as kind of a special music sort of thing um, every once in a while. It was a really small church, probably about uh, maybe 30 attendees at the most. Um, I grew up in a really small town. Okay. Uh, the biggest thing around was the Piggly Wiggly, if that gives you any <laughs> sense of it. So. Now, where was that? Uh, this up? was, it, it was a little town called Tunnel Hill, Georgia, which is right outside of Dalton, Georgia. Is that North uh, Georgia? 
Yeah, it's northwest Georgia, kind of the lower end of the Appalachian Mountains. Yeah, okay. Um, and yeah, about twenty, about twenty miles south of Chattanooga. So, um, yeah, that's where I grew up. Cool. Yeah. And uh, back on the story of playing in the church, um, the pastor's wife was the pianist there at that church, and uh, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, as I was, uh, starting to get kind of decent at playing the piano Mm -hmm. and, uh, she did eventually pass away. I think it was a couple years later after a diagnosis. And at that point I was actually the only other person at the church that could play the piano. So (laughs) at the age of, uh, I think I would have been 11 or 12, I was the full-time church pianist oh wow yeah that's 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 definitely a uh a lot of responsibility and a lot to carry at that age and uh um did, did were you working with any other musicians or was it just you or um when when i was really young they had an organist there as well okay. but uh she passed away at some point i never really knew her at all because i was so young um, so from that point, yeah, it was just a piano and that was it. Wow. So did you, uh, as you, as you're going throughout your musical journey, did you, did you incorporate playing guitar there? Uh, no, not there. Um, my family actually left that church when I was about 14 or 15. Okay. Um, and we went to another church of about the same size, just so, you know, they felt led to go somewhere else, so we did. Um, and I eventually did uh, start playing guitar at that second church. Um, not consistently, but just mm-hmm. every once in a while. Okay. Well, so you're living, um, you're living now, like, right outside of Atlanta. Right. On the north side, correct? Yeah, that's right. Okay, so so kind of, how did you end up there? And um, you know, was uh, well before we go there. So so how did did you what did you study something in, in like the background, like a, from an engineering perspective? Yeah, so that kind of ties into the reason I'm here now. Um, when I graduated high school, I took some drafting classes in high school, and I was uh, pretty interested in that stuff. So I decided I wanted to study architecture. Um, and there's only three schools in the state, or at least there were at the time, I'm not sure about now, um, that offered accredited architecture programs. And I ended up choosing one here in Marietta, just outside of Atlanta, um, called Southern Polytechnic State University. Um, so I went there, and after a couple of years of that, I kind of discovered that architecture wasn't really for me. Um, and from that point, it I had really kind of picked up guitar uh, pretty well at that point and one of my friends Andrew Thomas had actually kind of been inspired by the Brian May story with the red special and how he built it with his dad Yeah, and uh, he built his own guitar and at this point in time I was pretty ignorant of how guitars were built and um, that sort of thing and I was just fascinated that he was able to build his own guitar and uh, decided that I wanted to do that too. And so while I was still in the architecture program, they had a wood shop where they would build models mm-hmm. of their architectural designs. So uh, I actually used that wood shop to build a guitar. Um, and that's. I'll get into this a little later, I guess, but that's kind of how DS Engineering started was with uh, building guitars. But okay, uh, 
so after I decided I was done with the architecture program, um, after I had built a guitar, I was kind of interested in maybe trying to figure out how to build an amp. And um, one of my friends was in the electrical engineering program, and I was talking to him about that one day, and he told me that one of the professors in the electrical program was actually a former engineer for Fender. Mm. Uh, and I was like, oh, man, that's awesome. So I decided to uh, check it out in the interest of building amps, not knowing at the time that uh, they don't teach anything about uh, vacuum tubes and electrical engineering <laughs> anymore. <laughs> uh, but anyways, um, so I decided to get into electrical, and I fell in love with it. Um, and for my capstone class, I took a... a um, audio technology course and the former Fender employee was the professor for that class and uh, he was kind of my mentor. I would uh, see him outside of class hours a lot to ask him about different things I was tinkering around with and uh, I learned a lot from him. His name was uh, Bill Hodges. He designed uh, a lot of the solid state amps in the 80s and 90s. Okay. So that was pretty fascinating. So did you did you get an opportunity um, to delve in, in, into any of the tube technology? I mean, that's really hard to get formal uh, learning on that anymore. Yeah, I, I didn't learn anything about tubes at all in the engineering program mm-hmm. or from the professor because, like I said, he was a solid state guy. Yeah, so. yeah. Um, but uh, I've learned a little bit about it since then. The, the information you learn now can, in some ways, be applied to the, uh, the vacuum tube technology. There's just a few subtle differences between it. Mm-hmm. Everything now is just kind of an evolution of tube technology. Okay. Well, so so you're there. You're studying. You're studying engineering. Um, did did you? Did obviously you had this uh, desire to kind of tinker with music, uh, you know, with guitars, and then trying to get into amps, and then what what. What set off the idea, hey, I'm going to try this and try to offer products? And, you know, what took you there? Yeah, I I guess I never really um, desired to be a business owner. That wasn't something that was, like, really in me. But um, I've always been fascinated by building things. Legos and Kinects were my favorite toys as a child. Um, So... Yeah, I've, I've just always had this thing where I want to tinker with things, take things apart, put them back together. Um, so when I built the guitar, so many people were, well, I say so many, there weren't like hundreds of people, but um, a lot of people, you know, thought it was really good and crafted really well and kind of suggested to me that I should try to sell them. Um, so I kind of passively went down that road and, uh, I didn't have a business license or anything. I didn't know anything about business at all at that point. So, (laughs) (laughs) um, but I did, I did sell a a small handful of guitars and I built a few that I raffled away for Christmas charities and, Mm -hmm that sort and uh it didn't take me long to realize that for one thing i didn't have very good tools at the time um and for another thing it's just really hard to break into the guitar market uh there's a lot of overhead costs and Mm -hmm. your craftsmanship's got to be top notch and all that sort of thing so I eventually uh, just decided to to stop building guitars because it was just, I don't know, I guess I wasn't really enjoying it as much as I thought I would. Yeah. Um, 
and I had about a year break um, around the time of my wedding and then decided to start tinkering around with pedals. Okay. So what did you find when you got into pedals? What did I find? Yeah, what 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 did what grabbed you there? Okay. Um well, I guess the biggest thing is that it was directly related to my field of study, so um it didn't take me long to really understand uh kind of what it took to build a pedal and make a good product and um you know it was it was something i i knew really well so i just picked it up kind of quick and ran with it mm-hmm. um, yeah so i fell in love with that pretty quickly and kind of just trying to take it as far as i could yeah so did you so i was looking at your website earlier mm-hmm. and you've got the the chronograph is kind of um the the thing that uh you know if if you hear your company's name that's the th- first thing that pops up oh, yeah, chronograph. Sure. and then um then you've got some other offerings on there like some um external uh switches and tap tempos and some amp switching and and then you also it it, it showed where you know you offer some modifications to some pedals and some things like yeah. that um what how did that take form and shape up you know this is this is what i'm gonna do in my approach with uh you know the services that i offer sure um well the very first thing i built was a pedal for myself i have a uh an orange rocker 30 amp um okay and the foot switch for that thing as is the case with most amps is really large so it's not very pedal board friendly um so i decided i wanted to make a smaller version of that for myself and so i did that and um this was right around the time that reverb.com was getting started um and so i decided to just put it on there and kind of see what happened um and it didn't take long to where I was selling at least three or four of those a week. Oh, wow. Um, so that's kind of how I got started with selling the amp foot switches. Um, and that kind of led into making other variations of that, like the tap tempo switch and things like that. Um, and so that kind of got a little bit of cash flow going. And I started diving into more complicated things. Um and uh, eventually I bought a Strymon El Capistan with some of the money I had made and uh, that was the first Strymon pedal I had ever really seen Um, and I took it apart and kind of you know pumped around in it kind of checked out how it worked and that sort of thing and uh, decided to start doing modifications for those and so started selling those on reverb as well um and i think it was about a year or so after i really started selling some pedals um the in the 60 cycle home group ryan burke had made that uh I don't remember if it was a post or a comment or whatever, but he had somehow suggested that TC Electronics put a clock into the Polytune tuner pedal. Um, And I thought that was a really interesting idea. And uh, it's kind of funny, Josh Scott had commented on that thread and said, oh, that's a good idea. I'm going to like make a prototype and all this. And Mm -hmm. so... I kind of waited to see if he would actually do it or not, and um, I think a couple months later or so, he still hadn't come out with anything or any information about it, so I was like, all right, well, I'll, I'll pick this up and run with it, I guess. It was kind of in my wheelhouse. I really enjoyed doing uh, the digital stuff when I was in school, so um, 
and it was kind of one of those things where I was like, this is a really simple thing. This won't take long to figure out. And uh, quickly found out I was wrong. It took about six months to oh, wow. develop that pedal. So <laughs> <laughs> um, from the first prototype to the final prototype. So, um, yeah, at that point, I had kind of taken the time to learn a bit, a little bit more about business and what you sort of needed to do to legalize it and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I got my business license around that same time. Um, and I put the chronograph up on my website as a pre-order um, to kind of raise money for the parts because at that point I wasn't really uh, making enough money from the pedal business to just bankroll it um, because kind of a key thing with that pedal is that most people aren't willing to pay a hundred bucks for what is essentially just a clock with a foot switch um, so I had to figure out a way to make it cheap enough that it would actually sell um, which you know kind of made me realize that I needed to get as big of a volume discount as I could. Okay. Um, so that's why I decided to take pre-orders for it and uh, ended up getting about 75 pre-orders for the chronograph which was enough to get the kind of discount I was looking for on a volume yeah. Interesting. Uh, so, so the, so essentially what you're doing is like the, and, and correct me if I'm wrong with the chronograph, but, sure. the, but essentially the concept is you've got a clock on your pedal board. You can punch in and, and it, well, first of all, you can tell what time it is, but also you can punch in and time your sets. So, you know, like, okay, I've got a 30 minute set. I've got to be done that way you can gauge it and you can see it from your pedal board and and it kind of helps you keep track of time yeah exactly okay and so the price point on that is what now uh currently it's fifty five dollars oh wow okay so you really did you really did beat the hundred dollar by far yeah the initial prototype I had made was in a, a metal enclosure and looked considerably different than what you see now um and that first prototype i kind of figured up would cost about 85 dollars and i kind of i made some polls and posted them in various groups and kind of got a feeler for what people thought about that price point and um discovered that it was probably way too high so i kind of went back to the drawing board and uh figured out ways to reduce the cost uh -huh. so so is is that is that i would i would venture to say maybe that pedal is your most um like in demand yeah absolutely okay um i've sold 301 of those to date um it's by far the best seller as far as the pedals go I've sold about that many mods too but um, yeah, the, I think the next highest seller I've sold, like, maybe 60 or so. Uh -huh. So, it's certainly a flagship product, I guess you could say, at this point. Yeah. You know, I was thinking how cool it would be, not only to tell Tom, I know this would be almost near impossible, but if, like, guys like me who sing, who have trouble remembering lyrics... Um, oh yeah, it's like a teleprompter that fits on your pedal board. Yeah. That would be yeah, amazing. Just... I know that's that would be probably <laughs> ridiculously expensive and could be done like with an iPad. But <laughs> yeah, I was about to say iPad might be a good yeah. Solution and that's that. what I do use. But okay, you know, it'd be fun to uh, you know, in, in my head it would it would be fun to eliminate the the iPad off of my mic stand and somehow yeah. you know I could have it. In a more manageable spot. Yeah, sure. But do you use some kind of sort of a special app for that, or is it? I, I do. I use one called OnSong. Okay, yeah, I'm familiar with that. Yeah. 
and I can also, what's cool about it is I can do some other things besides viewing lyrics. I can uh, uh, trigger off like a track with it. Yeah. And it's got a metronome in it. And uh, it's also cool, like I can export it to like the rest of the band. You know, I can send out, I can shoot, shoot off an email real quick and they can pull it up on their device. Okay. So it's really cool. Um, really great app. But, um, yeah, I heard a lot of good things about it. Yeah. Oh, I, I got into it about two years ago and I depend on it so heavily. I actually, I busted the screen on my, on my iPad and I, I was like, well, I don't know if I should get a new one or take it in for repair. I took it in for repair and those things like, um, they don't always work right after you fix them, you know? Yeah. And, and I had to go get a, a, a second iPad in the interim just because I was so heavily dependent on it, you know? Yeah. So. I certainly understand that. My my wife cracked her screen on her iPhone a few years ago, and I decided I would try to fix that. And, oh my gosh, that was, <laughs> that was yeah. probably the most intimidating project I've ever done. All the parts in there just fit so perfectly, and all the connectors are microscopic, and it's just yeah. ridiculous. Yeah, they actually never, the place I took it to, and of course they warrantied their work, but they never got it right. Like, I took it back, like, three times, and, like, it'd always be something that didn't work just right, and finally, like, they ended up, like, sending me another one, because, oh, it, really? yeah, it just, it, it, and I, I understood, but it just got ruined as many times as I got in there and tried to fix it, and, uh, one of the first things that goes is the, um, the fingerprint thing yeah like uh if they if they go in and take that off it's almost impossible to ever get that right again so you lose that feature and then uh, uh, and then it just kind of goes downhill from there <laughs> yeah yeah the level of engineering that goes into those things is uh, just mind-boggling mm -hmm. so so you got the so you got the chronograph Kind of walk me through quickly the the other offerings that that you offer. Okay, um, I guess the the latest thing I have is the mandate series of switches. Mm -hmm. um, the idea behind that, I guess, was uh, it, they all use the same size enclosure, so. I kind of am able to order those in bulk and get them for a little bit less than I would if I was ordering them individually because I used to do that sort of thing just as a custom order and I would just order an enclosure in whatever color somebody wanted and build whatever switch they needed. Um, but <clears throat> to get a little more competitive, I decided to kind of standardize things. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there's a an amp version of that, a tap tempo version, there's, you can get a favorite switch for a strumming pedal. Um, a lot of people are actually using the two button switch for some fractal audio gear, like the AX8 and um, I forget what the other one's called, I'm not too familiar with their stuff, but I've had several orders for that. Um, that's really kind of it as far as the current offerings, uh, besides the mod services. Mm -hmm. um, got a few other things coming down the pipeline, but kind of struggling to get that stuff out. So Yeah. Well, how long have you been doing this? Uh, the first pedal I built was spring of 2014, I think. Okay. Um... Uh, yeah, a little over three years, three and a half years. Interesting. So, tell tell me a little bit, um, what the industry has been like for you, um, and kind of, um, you know, is it, it the networking with other people in the in industry? Has it been easy? Yeah, it's been uh, kind of surprisingly easy. When I was first getting started. Um, I just kind of assumed that the pedal market was like a lot of other markets where it's kind of a cutthroat thing and you have to 
fight to the death to compete for customers and that sort of thing. But uh, after I kind of got my feet wet and got into things, it, I picked up pretty quickly that everybody in the pedal industry, or most people in the pedal industry, I should say, are really friendly and willing to share information and help people out. Um, it's just unlike anything I've seen in the business world. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 from when I was at Summer Now, some of the conversations I had with people, it was really surprising, you know, and, and I think, I think it boils down to this. Um, you got a pedal board full of pedals. The days are gone when you see a guy who's, who's, um, gonna have like, say a boss pedal in every slot on his pedal board you know sticking yeah. with that one company because they offer every pedal he wants um what you see is and i think most pedal builders realize this is that they're offering flavors yeah yeah that's a good analogy yeah and so you know yeah you want to you want to offer something that's viable and something that's gonna be successful in the market but you're also you're you're sometimes a guy who's offering something different that nobody else offers his market may be limited to maybe um, a smaller pocket of the yeah. market share but maybe that market share is really really um lucrative for him yeah, that kind of ties into sort of my methodology with the things I do sell is, you know, the the pedal market is so saturated with different flavors of effects, like you were saying, that that was part of the reason I decided to go the route of doing modifications and switches and things like that, because there's not near as many people fighting for that space. Um and part of the reason the chronograph is sold so well, I mean, it's just simply because you can't get it anywhere else. Yeah. So it's the only option. Um, and that's that's kind of my the route I'm trying to take moving forward is to come up with stuff that nobody's done um, or just completely different approaches on things. And... Um, that seems to be working pretty well so far, so I'm going to try to continue in that direction. Yeah, well, I, it's definitely um, it's definitely unique. And um, how many times was have you been like to the trade shows? Uh, the first one I went to was Summer Nam last year, 2016. Okay. Um, and up until that point, I had kind of had the mindset, you know, that boss and some of these bigger companies were like these mega corporations and <laughs> uh, that's just not the case at all like you can pretty much meet the entire workforce of boss at NAM. Um and kind of the same deal with companies like JHS and Walrus some of the bigger boutique brands I kind of had this mindset that they were bigger than they really are mm -hmm. uh, but I met some of those guys last year, and that kind of brought me down to earth. And at that point, I kind of realized how willing everybody was to talk to you and share information and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, yeah I went to I went to Summer Nam last year, and then I went to Winter Nam early this year. Okay. And then, of course, Summer Nam again, where I met you. So. Awesome. Yeah, uh, that 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 was my first Nam. And, um, you know, just, it was completely, the industry is completely different than I thought it was as well. Yeah, I think, I think everybody kind of has that realization. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, I want to shift gears here for a minute. Um, yeah. You really uh, caught my interest in a post that you made on Facebook several weeks ago. And it kind of, to the effect was... And I'll let you kind of tell your story. I'm not going to tell your story for you uh, about sure. what you said. But to the effect of I was in a tremendous amount of credit card debt and I've worked hard. I've gotten out of it. 
and um, you know, if anybody wants to talk about this, uh, you know, hit me up. And I, I, yeah. I thought it'd be interesting because a lot of musicians, especially young musicians, um, we tend to have this gas to want to get stuff. Right. And a lot of times um, we think we need things and, and we really don't can't afford it. And we end up like swiping our credit cards and then, well, I'll sell this to fund this and then things don't quite pan out. And then next thing you know, sometimes like you end up in having several thousand dollars on a credit card that you're having trouble paying off. And um, people in general tend to just live with these huge chunks of debt and monthly payments that they're trying to pay. Um, And so when you had that kind of testimonial about uh, able to come out from under that, I really wanted to um, ask you, you know, what what steps did you take? How did you do it? And uh, what you would advise other people to do to get themselves out of debt? Okay, sure. Um, Well, I guess kind of some background. My my mom is an accountant, and um, so from a young age, she kind of, instilled some of these values in me of you know how to handle money and um i did really well with that up through college i was able to pay off my student loans six months after i graduated um and started making good money after i got a job outside of school and uh got married not too long after that and we kind of fell into this trap of just Assuming that we made enough money to kind of afford whatever we wanted, mm-hmm. um, so we we started. We didn't really track our spending very well, um, and part of what contributed to that, I think, is that we were newlyweds, and it was kind of this emotional high, and um, we just thought life was grand, and uh, just didn't keep a real good. Things. Um, so before I know it, I kind of tally up, you know, how much money we've got on all these credit cards, and it's over twenty grand. Wow! And uh, it just kind of, you know, punched me right in the chest, as you can imagine. I'm like, oh my gosh, we got to do something about this. <laughs> um, so my wife has always acknowledged that she's not good with money, and um, she she was really the one actually that kind of took the initiative to kind of seek help I guess and uh, she found a class at our church financial peace university the Dave Ramsey program mm-hmm. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with it um, and at first I was kind of uh, reluctant to go to it because you know I, I felt like I was I was good at handling money and uh, kind of in control and um, she kind of had to break down that that thought <laughs> and uh, so eventually I decided you know what you're right we've got a bunch of debt and we need to kind of see what we can do so we went through that class and um I actually learned more than I thought I would, and um, we kind of took those principles and ran with them. Uh, first thing was, you know, setting up a emergency fund, uh, locking away a thousand dollars of savings that you need for whatever emergency might arise, and then after that, just tackling debt as fast as you can and paying off the cards. So. Really, it, it was it was really as simple as making a budget. We didn't have a budget up to that point. And after we sat down and, you know, figured out how much money we bring in a month, what our expenses are, and decided how much we were going to allocate to to each sort of category, you know, it, was, it wasn't long before we started seeing how much we had been spending on things that we shouldn't have been. And taking that money and using it to pay down debt, 
after you get one card paid off, you can use the money you're using for that card to pay off the next one, and it just kind of snowballs from there. Uh, so really, just making a budget is key, man. It's uh, it was life changing for us, and uh, after we were kind of seeing where our money was going instead of wondering where it went, uh, it just made a huge difference. Mm -hmm. So how long of a process that was that for you to kind of come out from under debt? Uh, it was, I think it was 17 months. We were able to pay off all 22 some odd thousand dollars. I think it was. Yeah. Um, and that was with really without any major lifestyle change. Um, so I couldn't stress that enough to people. Just make a budget, know where your money's going, be smart about it, and uh, you'll see some good things happen. So, so I noticed uh, you post on Facebook or you and your wife celebrating an anniversary, but also um, y'all are expecting, right? Yeah, we are. Do October second, so it's coming oh, up pretty wow. quick. Wow! Wow! Okay. Yeah. Um. Well, you know something that that is so you're so fortunate that you're stepping into parenthood without that tremendous debt. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you just don't know the the <laughs> the amount of um, and I went through this myself where, you know. You, you get out of college, you're working your first job, you're used to making money, then you have kids, you get married, you have kids, and that money doesn't go as far as you, you know, used for it to go. And yeah. to have control of your budget and your spending before you get into that, because I'm going to tell you, being, um, you know, making emotional decisions when you're young and newlywed, that's even, um, it can even be like that with children you know oh well, i need yeah. to go get them all this kind of stuff and you end up you know really going beyond your means and i see a lot of people do that they go way beyond their means yeah that's and, a great point and having children <clears throat> so i i'm happy for you that uh you know you got control of this before you, it got too out of control and too far along in life yeah for sure God's timing is perfect, and we definitely feel blessed to have uh, to have learned about this stuff at the time we did, and yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Well, um, so you know if you're having a boy or a girl yet, or don't know? No, we're actually keeping it a surprise, so. That's awesome. Both of us, yeah, both of us like surprises, and uh, so we decided to go that route. And it's kind of funny, all the or most of the younger people that we run into ask that question. They're like, oh my gosh, how do you do it? I can't believe you're not finding out. <laughs> and, uh, all, all, most of the uh, older people we run, run into are like, oh, good for you guys. We couldn't find out. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They're kind of excited about it, so it's kind of funny. Me and my wife did the same thing uh, when we had, ended up having four girls. Wow. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, we just, you know, and, and people keep asking, well, are you going to have that boy? And it's like, well, I can't control that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is what it is, and we're going to love it, you know. What's the age range of your kids? Okay, I have a six-year-old, a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and a six-month-old. Oh, okay, wow. Got your hands full. Absolutely. Life <laughs> is, uh, there was an older person that saw my wife one day out in public and you know a lot of people like when you get that when you get four kids you know a lot of people are like oh my goodness I don't see how you do that you know and uh there was a lady that one day she just said to my wife she said well you know I bet things are very interesting around your house and, she, yeah. and my wife is like that's a good way of putting it it's not that things are crazy or out of control it's just we things are interesting in our life <laughs> Yeah, that is a good way of putting it. Yeah, my wife wants to have three or four kids, and I'm like a little hesitant. And mm -hmm. Let's get through the first one and kind of see how it goes from there. <laughs> yeah, 
yeah. if we decide to go down that road, I knew who to call for emotional support, I guess. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, anytime. <laughs> um, my, my wife knew she wanted four kids, like, all along. And um, so here we are, you know, uh, eight years of marriage later and uh, have four kids. So... <laughs> That's awesome. Man. Never envisioned, uh, never envisioned having a house full of kids, but it's it's pretty awesome. We uh, we are capacity in our minivan. <laughs> had, to, oh, yeah. had to make the transition to um, that about well when the third one came along. Yeah. And uh, it's no looking back after that. Yeah. I, I meet these large families sometimes, you know, that have like seven or eight kids, and it just, I don't know, the way my mind works, I guess, it just fascinates me with the logistics of that. Like, how do you manage all that? I just don't yeah. understand. So. <laughs> <laughs> we were, we were kind of, it, it's easy for us to kind of get a little smug about it because, like, you know, like when we go to church on Sundays, like, uh, we have like about a 30 to 45 minute drill that we go through, you know, trying to get off and get there on time. Of course, I got to be there an hour before to, uh, yeah. to run the worship team, um, rehearsals. And, um, it's kind of funny cause you'll hear somebody be like, oh, I just, I was running late, you know? And it's like, well, I mean, we do this every Sunday with four kids and, you know, we've gotten it down, and it, it, it's really just being disciplined, and, yeah. uh, and and getting organized, and that's the thing is, uh, it's painful to get organized, but when you have to, yeah, sure. when you, when you just know there's no other option, it kind of pulls you in that direction. So it's good to hear. We kind of struggle with organization and uh, punctuality, so. We're a little bit worried about how that's going to change when we have a kid. <laughs> yeah. I mean, whether it's going to be worse or be better or whatever. So, yeah. we'll see. Every time, every kid's been different. And it seems like, like our first one, it's like, oh my goodness, you know? Like, yeah. it's such a life change. The second one was a little bit added responsibility. And then, boom, when we hit the third one, it was like having a first child again. Like it was just all out. Whoa, we got our hands full. Then the fourth yeah. one came along. It wasn't that much different. Yeah, just, I guess at that point you're kind of on a downhill slope. So. Yeah, I mean, what you do for three, you're gonna do for four. Right. And um, I, I you know, it's been different. Like, I think on our first one, it took me about six months to get adjusted to where you know we were sleeping all night again and uh felt like we were on a level playing field again um fortunately like like this our six month old it was only about three months in and she was sleeping all night which is unusual but you know she just it 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 just um and and i ran on just drinking almost a pot of coffee a day kind of deal (laughs) just (laughs) just to stay alive (laughs) <laughs> yeah, man. I have a feeling I'm gonna have a lot more coffee in my future. Oh yeah, that's this part of parenthood is down <laughs> in the coffee and trying to get as much uh, caffeine you can legally to um, <laughs> <laughs> to keep going. And um, you'll find your. I've hit this point where I've had too much caffeine to where it's like. Um, you, you get the, like the headache the size of Texas, you know, because you yeah. had too much. Yeah, I used to drink a lot more coffee than I do now, so I know what you're talking about. I've had those days where I had the massive headaches. So. Yeah, you got to be careful how far I take it. I guess. Yeah, it just life gets back to normal. Just know that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it and you'll find a lot of joy from that as well you know once you see them growing up and it's it's a really good thing so yeah we're excited about it yeah i'm excited for you guys thanks man well uh are you are you making any plans are you going to be at winter now perhaps it's something i've been thinking a lot about lately because they're starting to book hotels and all that kind of stuff now so um 
I've, I've still got to figure that out. I would like to go, but at the same time, I'm going to have a three-month-old baby. and Absolutely. Uh, so, I don't know. I've just got to figure it out. I can't give a solid answer at this point. Yeah. Yeah, that's it, that. That's a for us guys in the southeast. It's a lot harder to get out to California. Yeah, it's a big commitment. Mm-hmm. It's a five hour flight from here. I don't know about you, but yeah, it's it's about the same out of New Orleans. Um, and I, I did book the flight, um, but now I just got to work out the logistics of you know everything else. Because yeah. I, I wasn't counting on the fact that Anaheim was a pretty good little drive from um, from LAX. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't realize that either. So, if I do go, I'm probably going to go to the other airport. I forget the name of it now, but oh, is there another airport that's? Yeah, there's a there's another one that's closer to Anaheim. Oh wow! But okay. at least from Atlanta, the rates are considerably higher so that's the downside i guess but by the time you pay for a taxi or uber or whatever from lax to anaheim you pretty much spent that much money anyway (laughs) yeah i'm almost like you almost got to get a car you know in a car to get get over there so last year i took a uber from the airport over to the condo and just kind of stayed in that area and walked everywhere I needed to go. Mm-hmm. But you were close uh, enough to to the uh, the show to walk. Yeah, we were just we were just a couple blocks away from the convention center. So nice, nice. Yeah, I definitely see um, like summer now if I continue to do it being like the real easy low hanging fruit. Yeah, and, and the other being the one you got to plan out a lot more. Yeah, that's certainly the case for me as well. Well, cool, man. Um, well, hey, thank you so much for uh, taking the time out of your day. I know you're a busy man to uh, to come be on the show. And um, uh, when I met you at NAM, I just knew that um, you know I'd love to have you on the show and uh, tell us about what you do. And and I know our listeners are going to enjoy it. And um, you're you're active in 60 cycle hum and um some of the other groups then we we kind of crisscross paths there some and so um our listeners you know where to hit daniel up go check out his website dsguitarengineering.com and um thank you again daniel yeah thanks for having me awesome man well you have a good one you too all right bye bye